Hi. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about concept art, uh, but I just want to hear really quickly from you guys. Just a few people, just go ahead and tell me what you think, what you would like to find out. Just a few minutes. Yell it out. Software is okay. What else? Okay, our approach to concept art, AI, cool. Animation, okay, awesome. That's actually a it's something with Unreal Five. Oh, how we collaborate? Okay, cool. Anything else? What's that? F fighting artwork. Say again. Art block? Yeah. Oh, art block. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I was like, what are you talking about, art block? Someone pays you and you just fucking do it. What do you... No, okay. I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Also, keep in mind, um, I'm a creative director, so I haven't been a concept artist professionally for quite a while. So my understanding of everything is of a kind of overview. So I'm going to talk about things from an overview. Uh, this talk is for two hours. So two hours, I can talk for two hours easily. Um, and it's a little bit free form, meaning I have a structure of what we're gonna do, but if we have certain interests in certain areas, I might dive in. I'm also gonna explain everything um, kind of as if your mom was here and you were explaining to her why you're not a graphic designer. Um, like, I'm gonna explain it that simply, but at the same time, I'm not gonna slow down and say, this is what a modifier is in Blender. I might just say, this is the, the idea roughly, but I'm, I might click fast if I open a 3D file because this isn't gonna be like a tutorial about how to use certain things. Although, if you're expert in Blender, for example, you're gonna be able to kind of track with it. But if you're a beginner, it'll be over your head and that's okay um, because it'll be just to show you, hey, this is the thing that it can do. Um, I think I'm gonna start right here because I had all these folders in order, but I like this one. So, And I'm gonna just uh, sketch ideas here in Photoshop just to kind of explain my thinking on a, on a few certain ideas. So concept art, it used to be like a person is over here and they do like a little sketch, right? That's how it used to be. Um, and then you give that sketch to the art director, right? They look at it, uh, they give you a thumbs up on it, and then you go ahead and you like finish painting it, right? And you just paint it all up, you make it nice. And you used to do it in gouache or whatever, right? Then Photoshop happened. So now, instead of doing this painting part, which might have taken, you know, weeks, now instead of that part, Photoshop happens. So now that same painting that took weeks now maybe takes a couple days, right? Maybe three, four days in Photoshop you can paint it. Or maybe a week, actually. Like if you wanted to do something kind of real and you would use like photo bashing and you would use like uh, um, hand painting with the, with the brushes in Photoshop, as most of you know, that's kind of how it was for a while. What happened some, at some point, and I'm not exactly sure who started it, but I know when I was in college, um, there were some concept artists doing this, so almost 20 years. But some intrepid concept artists decided to start using 3D, um, which is really hard for artists, because 3D is just, it's an awful artistic nightmare. It, it crushes every part of your spirit, and uh, because it's so technical. Uh, and I liken it to sort of, um, when you can't use 3D now in the concept art game, you're kind of like the bad guy from Avatar, but without the mech suit. You know what I mean? And then once you have 3D, you are him in the mech suit. And so it sucks because you're not hand to hand anymore. You're, you're once removed through this giant machine, but you kind of can't be messed with anymore because you're a giant mech. And so that's why the 3D process took over. It's not because anybody liked it or anybody was like, oh, this is gonna be really fun. It's awful. If you, if you, those of you in here who don't know 3D and you're thinking about going into it, it's truly a nightmare. And I mean like, you, you'll spend like half a day, Maria knows, you'll spend half a day like trying to figure out why one thing isn't working and it's a checkbox somewhere deep buried in the menu that you had no idea about. But okay, now concept artists use a lot of 3D and let me show you some of the results. So this is our work that is, I would say getting on to 75% 3D, right? And with some Photoshop on top, like 20% Photoshop on top. Um, you can design pretty quickly in 3D. You can add photos to the places where it doesn't, you know, it needs a little bit of a touch up. On The Last of Us Part Two, we did a ton of stuff in Photoshop and in 3D. And it also depends on how good you are in Photoshop. Some people in Photoshop are 
really good. Like we had this concept artist, Florent, who was like a matte painter. So his Photoshop integration skills were incredible. And to be fair, that's a harder skill set. 3D kind of does a lot of stuff for you. So it's a double-edged sword. It's actually a little easier now to hire artists because if they're really good with 3D, well, they, they kind of don't have to know lighting out of their mind as well because the 3D is doing the lighting for you. They have to have other compositional skills, but um, the skill set kind of changes a little bit. But a lot of these are a combination of mostly 3D and a little bit of Photoshop on top. In Last of Us 2, we really stepped it up in that regard and the results were insanely realistic. And so we just kind of couldn't go back. So what happened was now we're using 3D for everything. Um, and then what happened is, well, the end result is 3D, right? In most cases, the game is 3D, the movie is VFX is 3D. So how long is it before we do this and then they just use it? Well, not too far off. Um, and so just to cut to the chase, in my opinion, that's the future of concept art. In my opinion, there's gonna be a concept artist right here and there's gonna be a final shot right here. Like, and I mean like the final shot, VFX or whatever. And then the concept artist is gonna make it and then it's gonna be done. Now, there's gonna be a lot of people here in between. Of course, there's gonna be a lot of people who give feedback, who have ideas, who there's gonna be art directors in a film. You're gonna have production designers. You're gonna have um, set decorators. There's all kinds of people in between that are gonna have comments on this, right? But the first shot of everything is gonna be done by the concept artist. The first idea for the composition of the lighting, of the layout. Um, for a game, it might be a little trickier, right? Because games need certain kinds of geometry. So it's not gonna be as likely, but as you guys, a lot of you know, with Unreal 5, like geometry is at the verge of not mattering. You know, maybe it, maybe soon, I mean, of course soon it's not gonna matter. What, how many polys it is and how it's built. Soon, it's, soon none of that's gonna matter. As soon as that pipeline is complete, the concept artist becomes what I would call an art god. And I know it sounds like I'm just saying, oh, your profession's gonna take over everything. It is, yeah, in my opinion, it is. Um, and not because it's not gonna be collaborative anymore. It's just that this person is going to have the first say on everything and then everyone else can totally feel free to pick it apart. The last thing I wanted to say too that adds a little layer to this that I'm gonna just talk about is there's, have you guys seen those LED walls? So in movies like The Mandalorian, and shows like The Mandalorian, they have this thing called an LED wall that I'll talk about. And it's basically like, uh, and I'll talk about it more later, it's this incredible 3D, it's incredible real life space like these walls, but they put an image on it, an LED image, like a giant TV screen. And then they just shoot the actors and they shoot at the screen. And the screen is emitting light, so it lights the person perfectly. And so the concept artist work is gonna go into the LED wall, be in the shot, and then be transferred to VFX at some point. So once I, once I break that down a little bit, you'll see how much this is already happening now and how crazy powerful it is. Okay, so one other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of process, uh, just in terms of the way you guys uh, should think about it, especially if you're just kind of starting out, getting into some, uh, some 3D shenanigans. So the reason it's so hard now, because it used to be pretty straightforward, the reason it's so hard is because you're here, right? And you want to do something right here, let's say. This is your final goal, art-wise. And now, drawing maybe got you to here. You just have to do drawing and you could get this awesome result. Or let's just say this is the awesome result. And you would do the drawing here and it would get you to the awesome result. Now you have to use 3D, okay? So you go over here to learn this 3D software. But then in Blender, which is the software we use, you learn about modifiers and then modifiers are a whole nother world here. And then you go into this whole other world and you only need like one thing from it. But you have to go into the whole world just to get the damn one thing you want. And then someone says, have you heard of Character Creator? It's a good character program. Okay, cool, a whole nother damn world. And you have to go there just to do like this thing and this thing. And then you have to go to a whole nother damn world here just to get two or three things. And so it's structured like that. I wanted you to see this mind map because that's how it's structured. It's super annoying because every time you walk the threshold of a new world, you're like, duh, no, not another whole world, but that's how it is. And once you're kind of familiar with this world and you're kind of familiar with this world and you, you, you get a couple of these worlds under your belt, you wanna do this image, you go bam, 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 you grab everything you need off the shelf and you come back. 
it becomes crazy, crazy fast. Also, I wanted to talk about quickly, um, what's the difference between art and design? So, you know, this is art, this is fine art. And uh, I think a lot of maybe people and studios and everybody's a little bit confused about the difference between what like concept art is and design. Art like this, which I actually really like this. I don't like this, this is Kandinsky, this is Clifford Still. But I wanted to show both of them. This is someone just expressing, they're, they're coming up with their own problem to solve. Maybe the problem is like, what's the best way to express anger? And then they do something like this. That's art in, with a capital A. But what we do is different. What we do is design. And design is solving a problem. And so design can be solving a design problem like Daniel Simon for Oblivion. He designed this amazing ship. And the problem he's trying to solve is how do the jets work? You know, what looks cool? He, he came up with this idea of a dragonfly, which is reminiscent to humans of a dragonfly. So we kind of, we are, when we see it, it looks a little more familiar, but you don't quite know why. Um, he has to solve problems about how the legs extend and come down. Um, he has to solve problems that the, maybe the movie makers told him, well, by the way, you know, Tom Cruise is going to have to open this thing and put some stuff in it. So he's got to solve for that. So he's taking all these factors together and he's trying to solve a problem. Uh, so this is really important in order to come up with this result. The reason I say that, well, actually, let me talk about one more example. Another kind of problem you have is a story problem. I mean, Casper was talking about it before too. You have a story idea, right? Someone says in The Last of Us 2, for example, we had uh, the thing that was, um, it was beautiful decay. That was our buzzword, beautiful decay. Um, and you have this story of this girl and she's exploring this world that's been abandoned for 30 or 40 years. So the story of the environment is abandoned world for 30 or 40 years. So this is another one of uh, Florent's amazing concepts. Um, and then the story becomes, okay, well, what would happen? I mean, how did this bridge get collapsed? Maybe, a, maybe there was a war when the apocalypse happened and this bridge collapsed. Um, maybe there was massive floods. Maybe that's a story. So when I say story, I don't mean once upon a time. When I say story, I mean what the story of the thing was. And then you as an artist think, all right, what would be a cool thing to happen in that, in that context? And you imagine, oh, well, this was a road and now it's flooded, but all the cars that came here were in traffic, right? They were in traffic because it was apocalypse, but then everybody had to abandon their cars and they left. And then the water level rose, like all of that information is super obvious. And most concept artists and most of the portfolios that I see, a lot of the struggle is like, just think through the story. It's not that time consuming, you know? You just have, you just have to think of it and then think it through, think it through, and then put an image together. There's a lot of other things to put an image together, but have that in your mind. This is another one. What's the story? Who lived here? You know, clearly it's been abandoned. How do I know? Because there's leaves on the ground. Um, this apple though is fresh. So this is his mistake. That's too fresh of an apple. That's, that apple wouldn't be that fresh. It would be black at this point. That's outrageous. Fired. <laughs> Um, but this mind-blowing image is all about, okay, maybe they left books, they had a thing on the stove, they left in a hurry. Um, they obviously left in a hurry or they were dragged out and executed because their case is right here. Plus they were eating two oranges that are in very good condition at the same time. Now, if we were being picky, we'd pick on the food, but you can say someone squatted in here, then they left, then the windows blew out, then it was abandoned for quite a while. And then that's when we came here. That's a lot of information to get from nothing but stuff, right? The next thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, is just a personal thing of mine. Um, what's a good brief? Because a lot of us, you know, I deal with art, other art directors all the time and I'm an art director too. So I know what artists need, I think. And I kind of, I get a lot of experience of what art directors, um, ask for. And I think, um, for a brief before I actually do that, I want to open this one. I wrote the perfect brief. A lot of people call and they're like, hey, we got an image and they want to jump on a call and we talk about it for 45 minutes and then we get on another call and then they send us some images and then it's a bunch of emails and then we got some WhatsApps too, just to check in and then let's Skype you to, uh, let's unpack this more, let's circle back. This sentence, two Navy SEALs 
walk into an abandoned World War II era tank warehouse in the Brazilian jungle. The roof has partially collapsed from shelling, derelict Soviet tanks are everywhere, and it's tropical, hot, sunlit day with indoor god rays and a wet jungle feel. Done, done. If you give any concept artist that, you're done. You don't have to do one more thing. You don't have to show them a picture. You don't have to give them anything. On our team, all these things are known quantities. So I think one of the things that makes concept art slower in sort of the production process, and we'll talk about that more, is that uh, a lot of times we're overthinking what needs to be done, or we're imagining a world in which the concept artist is gonna somehow magically come up with something that nobody else thought of. And I'll talk about why that's really tricky. I think in general, if you are um, bringing concept artists on, it's the art director and the leader's job in a way to say, okay, this is what we're doing. And it doesn't have to be more than that. If it was a little more than that, it could be this. And again, just wanna know these two characters, they're in a space, like can anyone, can, can anyone draw to this level? If you can draw to this level, you can give your team so much valuable information because they're visual and this is super duper clear. You do a little thing, it's this building, it's this kind of vehicle, maybe. Uh, it's this adult man and child, he's tagging along. It's structure on top of glacial ice, okay? And then uh, I like, you know, the, this, is the, this is the imagined art director saying, I love the feel of this ice. A future version of this chopper this is the hind a chopper. Um, and so, yeah, I would look at this and this is like one tiny little step more. I think this is plenty. Uh, the only thing that I would do as an art director is I always have my own little things that I want. And they're not necessarily what the client wants. They're in addition to what they want. But for example, the structure is built on top of glacial ice. Well, if this is a grounded game, you can't build things on ice, especially glacial ice, right? Because it cracks. So I would say, I would try to, now in my mind, I would say, that's not, doesn't make sense. So I'm gonna pitch the client or whoever it is, this better idea and explain it to them. And I might do it with art. I might just, it's not that hard. You don't have to defy them to do that. You just put rock here. And then they ask, why'd you put rock? And you're like, oh, I just thought you couldn't build on glacial ice. And they're like, no, we want it on. Okay, well, if you really want it on glacial ice, we can do that. That's how I think about it. And I wanna open this one because I think this is a big part, another big part. This is what kills great concept art a lot of the time is let's say you have an art director here. And then here's me as uh, another next person in the chain of command. So this is boss client, this is me. Or in this case, there's even another person, right? Because I'm running a team. So that's me and then this is somebody else. One of our artists, one of our great artists. So the art director says to me, it's a shot of the sunny crisp day in the Himalayas. But me, as a concept artist, you have to have your own hills that you want to die on. Have you guys ever heard that expression? You chose, like people say you chose that hill to die on, which means like you were not giving up this damn hill. You would give up anything else, but this is the hill you chose. Um, and what I mean by that is, and I don't mean this in a dickish way, I just mean inside you, you care about certain things. So for me, if they said Himalayas and sunny crisp day, immediately in my mind, I'm like, oh, the Himalayas. And I start thinking about like, oh, I love the Himalayas and I've, I've been to I've been to Mount Everest. I didn't climb it. I'm not trying to be cool. I looked at it from far away, from like 17 miles away, and I took a picture. And I almost died just taking that picture. You can't breathe in the Himalayas. It's 17,000 feet before you start walking. How many meters is that? Like 7,000 meters. But from all the things that I've seen of the Himalayas, or people climbing them, and the incredible altitude or I might see an incredible, inspiring photo. I'm not just here to find out what the art director only told us. I'm bringing something too, right? Everyone is. So they said sunny, crisp day in Himalayas. A lot of concept artists might see this photo and be like, ooh, that's crazy. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, you can do that. Try it. They said sunny, crisp day, Himalayas. They said character. I mean, in your mind, it might just be Himalayas, right? but you look at a bunch of pictures and you see this really cool knife ridge and you're like, that's cool to me. So I want that to be their thing. So you're allowed to pitch them your thing. That's how I look at it. And that's how I look at the concept artists that, that I work with too. I want them to bring their own thing to the table. 
So some of mine, my little things are, I want an incredible sense of scale. So that's kind of a one pixel brush thing. It's not everybody's thing, but it's my thing. And because I run the studio, I get to have it. So I always get to have my thing that I want. Some other art director might get, you know, has their things. So for me, scale is important. So I'm gonna want something where we have a shot that's really close and we have a shot that's, you know, that goes off into the distance. I wanna feel that go, 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 I want that. So I already by default, no reason not to have that. I always want a person in the shot. I know, I'm sorry, stick salesman. I want a stick salesman. I always want a person in the shot because I want someone, I, I need to feel like I'm in the shot. So yeah, okay, the story of most shots, talking about the story, the story of this shot, if it's just Himalayas, is, you know, person on a trek. There's still some room though, like what if they're, what if they tell you the story is this person is was abandoned here? Well, then they would be like, their body language would be different. And I would actually be kind of a stickler for it. We still got music going, huh? Um, sorry about that. I was just jamming. Um, I'd be kind of a stickler for all the little things like the pose because I, I tend, this is another hill I choose to die on. However small that damn person is, make them correct. Don't make them like this if they've been here in a blizzard. Like if they're in a blizzard, have them like knocked over. I know it's a tiny part of the image, but the entire story of the image is on that little thing. So 90% of the time in concept art, the, the portfolios that come through that are maybe really technically pretty good, and I know it's not a big deal, and I know they hired you to do the environment shot, they didn't hire you to, to decide where stick salesman was gonna go, they didn't even ask for it. We're always, always gonna put some storytelling in the shot just because it's cool. And it makes you feel like as if you were, you're in it. Okay, so this one is a tough one because in addition to that, in order for a concept artist to do something creative, because everybody imagines that the concept artist is gonna do something creative. Like, they, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll you'll get a thing, we got a brief recently that said, we wanted you to design a dragon, but we don't wanna show you any reference because we want you to really run with it. We wanna see what your explorations is, are, what they are. And part of me was just like, okay, it's made of bunny rabbits, you know? No, okay, well then tell me something about the world. Is it a medieval world? Because what they're saying is, we don't know what the equation, we're not gonna actually, we know the equation, we're just not gonna tell it to you, but come up with a solution. No, that's not what we do, because this isn't art. This is design. So if it was art, then yeah. But if it was art, I'd never have to answer to the art director. I would just do what I did and then send it to them. I need an equation to possibly come up with a creative solution. It's not always gonna be the same. I must have that equation. And here, it's on the art director, in many cases we're working with, whoever's in charge of that IP, to say, this is my potential vision for this thing. Um, because that's the only way, this person is the only person who can give this person permission to do something crazy. Like if you told me it was a dragon, I'm just gonna do a dragon. I'm not gonna make a dragon out of gemstones. Like I'm not gonna make a ruby covered dragon. That's not gonna be one of the concept artists variants that he came up with. Cause he's got no reason to do that. It would be insane. And plus they might get fired. The client would be like, what the hell are you doing? You can't go in a creative direction unless you're given permission. So that means the person who's in charge needs to say, we're allowed to do some crazy stuff. I example this. Let me give you an example of what I think. And I don't know how this was done. But if you guys have seen this show, Foundation, it's a pretty cool show, except for episode five and six. But then it picks back up at the end. This is like a, it's a sci-fi fantasy world. It's pretty badass. But the main bad guy slash good guy slash whatever, ruler, his name is Empire. He runs, he's... He's leader of the galaxy. And everyone else is in kind of normal, what you would expect. And this guy's in blue armor, blue plastic armor. It's completely insane. It doesn't match anything else in the show. It completely sticks out. But it's badass. When you're watching the show, you're like, whoa, dude, why is that guy's got like blue armor? Like what happened in this world? That... But he is the most special person in the universe. He's responsible for trillions of the people. He leads the galaxy. So, okay, story-wise, maybe he needs to be special on special. And he also needs to air, and the character does too, he needs to project this air of insane sort of power. So, cool. You think a concept artist, when they were doing, you look at the rest of this image, is going to say, okay, I got an idea. Blue armor. 
blue plastic armor for this guy. No, it's impossible. That's asking way too much. This ship uh, in Dune, okay? If you guys remember the movie, this one is great because I, I, I wasn't in the room, but I can't imagine. This one is a great testament to how the process of concept art has changed quite a bit. Because if we were back in the sketching days, right, and someone was like, we're looking at ideas for ships. All right, we're looking for ideas for ships. Um, and you, you were doing it that traditional way, right? You know, you're, you're doing those shape designs. Did you guys all learn this in school? You know, like you do a bunch of shapes and you see what sticks. In Star Wars, they did it a lot, and that's how they came up with the X-Wing. You know, and the X-Wing is really cool because they started with shapes. And it's really hard to beat Star Wars, right? But Dune was pretty cool, right? I mean, the sci-fi was like, no, oh, that's new. It's unique. Well, how did they do unique sci-fi? Well, they couldn't have done it this way. They couldn't have even approached it this way. Because what, what sketch would you show the art director? I got an idea, dude. <laughs> show this to the director. He's going to love it. What is it? It's a toilet paper roll slash ship. And the little ships come out of it. Because that's what happens. It's a portal. That's his idea for a portal. Holy shit. How could that possibly ever fly? Well, the only reason it works, the only reason it could have been sold, one, Denis, which is how you pronounce it, by the way, Denis Villeneuve and Patrice, um, the greatest Frenchman who ever lived, uh, they came up with, they, Patrice must have said, yeah, you're, allow, you're allowed to do some crazy stuff. I like the idea of a, of a donut. But also, the execution had to be at this level. And they show here they had some avocado ideas. It says right here. No, literally, they said here in the description, this was some avocado options. Um, it had to be executed with materials and all that to this level before you, could, uh, before you could consider it. Do you know what I mean? So the 3D process that we use has a lot of advantages for doing unique stuff because you can't pitch the drawing of the toilet paper roll, but you can pitch this because in order for a human mind to accept this design, you need to see the scale. Otherwise, it doesn't compute. So whoever made this probably mocked it up in 3D. And that's another thing. This 3D process opens up some brand new things. Last example, Abby in Last of Us, right? She's a character that we've never seen in a video game ever. Uh, she's a buff woman. Now, if you were working at a normal game company and you just said, I got this idea for our protagonist for half the game, it's going to be a buff woman with muscles. Like, there's just no way that would fly because people would be like, but why? Like, what are you talking about? Whereas this, why was this solution possible? It was possible because Neil knew what his equation was. His equation was, we're in the apocalypse. Okay. This is a hard world you have to survive in. Okay. It would make sense that everybody had to participate. Fair. And therefore, the women would be just as ripped as the men, or at least some of them would be, because why not? Like, that's this world. Without this story problem, that equation could have not amounted to that. It would have been impossible. So that's why it's so important to just know either whoever decides it, figure it out. Sometimes nobody's decided it, I'll decide it. And, it, and if, even if I didn't decide it, the artist will decide it. I'll tell them, you think of your own story and you make it work for yours. On Last of Us 2, um, there was a lot of me. This doesn't happen that often, um, but it happens sometimes because the nature of doing, being an outsourcing studio, we're 35 outsourcers and we work for whomever. The nature of being an outsourcer is most of the time people don't have the time and money to tell us just have fun for six months, like try a bunch of stuff. Normally they're a little more strict budget-wise, but in the case of Naughty Dog, they weren't. So they would just say, come up with 10 shots. Me, like come up with 10 shots. Now, I knew that if I gave it to the artists, they were going to be a little bit lost because they would be going with nothing. And I mean like, we're in Seattle, come up with 10 shots. Okay, well, we've done Apocalypse to death a billion zillion times. So it was on me to fly around in Google Earth and think, what's the story of these shots? And what's something that I haven't quite seen before? Okay, maybe an aerial shot of a building that's completely dilapidated, and then there's like water everywhere. The, the angle in the building is maybe my like idea. This is the shot that I showed you earlier, that crater island. I thought, okay, we're in Seattle, so I'm actually Google Earthing Seattle, so it's actually Seattle. Uh, let me pull back that. That's that one. Um, 
obviously the artists are insanely awesome. That's Balash is incredible. Um, but uh, I'll do a scribble like that and say, okay, what if it created a giant lake and in the middle of that lake was the remnants of an old building? So it almost felt like an island or like basically like a, a shell kind of came here, blew out this whole section of the city because it turned into some kind of a, a cataclysmic war. And then this island sort of, there was still some remnants of this island in the middle of it. That was the story, right? So I would just, what if there was a giant cenote and it collapsed into the ground and we were looking down into infinity? So you see what I'm doing with every shot is trying to think, okay, what's a new thing I can do in Seattle? What's this story? And what's something visually maybe that we haven't seen before? Again, showing back how it do was done back in Star Wars days. Check it out. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, Ralph McQuarrie, like, there, there aren't a lot of concept artists, I don't think, anymore that can draw this well, right? And it's a shame, but it's also like, yeah, well... Now you just use a Blender character and pose them. I mean, the drawing absolutely will help. The people who know how to draw can design a lot better because they can go on top of their design and draw it. But this used to take a really long time, right? And it would go from this to this. And it would take quite a long time, right? You have to hand paint it. Now, for those of you who asked at the beginning what our process is, it's final from the start. And we started doing that quite a while. We're basically... We were doing this Predator poster. Let me show you the final. So that was the final poster we did for Predator. Okay, and it was mostly 3D. There's some photos here in the foreground. But our first passes that we're sending them is not going to be a sketch. Uh, and the reason is because you know it's Predator, right? We know, we know what some of the problems of that equation are. We know it's Predator. Okay. So we're pretty safe bet that it's not going to suddenly not be Predator. Good. So then we get a 3D model of Predator, or we make a 3D model of Predator, and we spend, uh, we can build in 3D really fast now. Like ZBrush, we could build a character like this in like one day, or maybe a day and change, a day and a half. Uh, and the client might be like, well, we want to see some sketches. And it's a tricky game that I play all the time, which is like, hang on, we know what our total budget is, let's say for this image, like hours wise, this might be like a 40 hour image, let's say. And we're going to spend 12 hours, 15 hours of our budget sort of making this character in 3D, finding all the pieces in 3D, framing up the shots, and then coming up with all these different shots. Because once we have the pieces, we can move the lights around. So we're going maybe like a full 15 hours. Client hasn't seen anything yet. Now, as a freelancer, that's tricky. Because you have the classic, I want daily updates, right? And that's that can be... Uh, to my mind, it can be the death of, of certain kinds of processes and to the concept artist. Because the I want daily updates says, like, in some ways, like, I don't necessarily trust that you're going to, and you might, and it's fair, because I sometimes want to see stuff a lot more, but I don't trust you enough to kind of go and do it. I kind of want to check in. Like, I want to taste the batter before the cake is done. And our policy is, well, we're the chefs. You hired us. So I'll make you a little cupcake version of the cake. You taste that. And if you like that, then we'll make the cake. But it takes a little bit of like wrangling to be like, just give us a room, just give us a second. And 99 out of 100 times, once, they, once we send this with all these options, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we're good. Um, and by the way, after they see this, what do you, you want? You want the light moved? Easy. Trees moved? Easy. The reason this is so great is because it doesn't matter whatever they change. Unless now this is Pokemon, then we're in good shape. Now, sometimes, you know, some clients, they might be like, yeah, it's Pokemon. Now you're like, okay, well, you're going to have to add to the budget. But for the most part, we're all good. Uh, so that's a fundamental cornerstone of our process is that we are pretty much building the whole scene and designing the whole thing in 3D right away with a little bit of day and a half buffer. We got to be kind of fast. I mean, if ZBrush took longer than a day and a half, I didn't know that was possible. I had talked to ZBrush artists back in the day. They would say, oh, character, that takes like two weeks. I'm like, okay, well, then this doesn't work. But once one concept artist got fast in ZBrush using a combination of kit bashing plus Blender, plus, again, I don't know the particulars of their process, but once, once someone can do a 3D model of Predator in 12, I don't care if they find it online, in 12 hours, then we're never drawing another Predator ever again. Does that make sense? Like as soon as it was possible in 3D, that, that immediately, where's my mouse? Oh, it's this side. That immediately ended this. 
and it, it never came back because why would it why would you ever go back to that when you can just have this in 3d and make it in like three hours okay that's the first part any questions yes when you do the 3d scene let's say for the pressure for example mm -hmm. Paint over in Photoshop, but I'll show you a couple examples of that. It's a little bit, it's getting less and less in Photoshop. And by the way, that doesn't mean some people can't composite really well in Photoshop. I would say the best concept artists I've ever seen are masters. They're like matte painting level, masters of using photos as well. It's just that now, if you're just good at 3D, I can kind of hire you. Like everything I'm saying is coming from a practical money-based, who can I hire perspective. So. If it's, you know, it's not, it's not romantic at all. It's just like, what do we need to do? So yeah, if we can hire someone that is good at, really good at 3D, the last little part we can help them with. But if they were bashing in Photoshop and the bashing was the lighting was off, it'd be really hard to fix. Any other questions? Okie dokes. Fundamentals. We'll talk about that right now. So here's what I think the art pillars are for us. This, based on our prog, this is a recycled slide. Uh, let the 3D do the work, especially the form and lighting. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is Gabriel, Slovak artist. Um, this is his 3D. Let me open it in Photoshop so we can do a little bit of turnsy offsies onsies. So you can see exactly what I would say is the difference between Blender and 3D. So that's the Blender, right? And you can see it's pretty far along, right? This is the raw 3D. You can see the lighting is pretty much figured out. There's even like this geometry, this really simple geometry for below the chairs. This texture, right? How is this possible to do this whole scene in like a day? right? Or two days. He probably spent more time on this. This is pretty complex, but we're talking between day or two. Well, that texture is off, but it kind of doesn't matter, right? This isn't like 3D modeling. It's just kind of getting what we expect to be final at this stage. And by the way, this is what we would send the client. We wouldn't even send them a version. We wouldn't even send them a version before this. We would send them this because anything we send to the client, we want it to be compositionally finished. Composition and lighting wise finished. I don't care if, if, the, if the lighting or if the textures are off or if there's that, you know, that doesn't matter. But what matters is that when you look at it from far away, it's the final one. And that also saves a lot of time too, because it presumes like if we're doing it in 3D, it's easy to come up with the final. We'll just, just decide what everything is supposed to be now. So let me turn this on and off and you can see. There was a little bit of softening and blending of some of that stuff down below. There's a little bit of blur you can kind of see on everything. There's a little bit of grain. This really, really subtle, beautiful glow that's happening here. And then there's some dust falling, but it's really subtle. And when I say let the 3D do the lighting, the number one problem I see with artists is they do, th they do this process and then they just mess with the 3D too much. Like they take it over. By the way, you can, you just have to be really good. So just don't, or be really good. Uh, but it's a dangerous game. That's what I say. I just say it's a dangerous game. Like play it if you want, but you better win. Here, there's just a little more fog. There's some dust added. There's a nice little grain on this thing too. And you can see the simple, the simpleness of the 3D or the bad textures or whatever. The really hard thing for 3D artists probably if they were transitioning into this would be like, damn, that texture's off. I can't leave it like that. But knowing when to leave the 3D alone is big. Finding the right photo. This is a lot of hand painting down here. That actually looks pretty mushy. But like if you move back, you see the, 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 the sand texture that's added to that is really slight. Here's another example. This one is even more simple. So on this one, let's see here. On this one, this is the Photoshopped version, okay? 
and this was the 3D version. Now this is a perfect, this is a very subtle example of how to take it too far in Photoshop. And when I say let the 3D do the lighting, I mean let the 3D do the lighting. So the lighting here in 3D, and this is a taste thing, and I'll talk about that in a second. It's all about just being classy, like subtle and classy and cinematic. So this, when you had just the raw 3D, it was kind of subtle and classy and cinematic in my mind. It was a soft light. The guy, listen, we saw the guy. Yeah, we already saw him. He read okay. He didn't need bling on bling on bling on bling on his, on his outfit. He didn't need that. He, he, we, we had no problem seeing him. We also, the fog is not adding to the story, right? The fog is just there to separate things. But we already read the depth really nicely. So normally you use fog to separate depth. I'm not sure that we needed the fog. And even this thing, this bright glow, it's almost cooler that I'm like, what is that? It's almost something. It's not something. Does that make sense? It's like a subtle sensibility. Um, and it comes from cinema. Cinema. Here's some awesome Aton images. I'll look at those in a second. It just comes from like taking a deep breath, you know, just slowing down and being like, all right, let's look at some movies frames. The storytelling is very clear. The lighting is relatively simple, right? Like if a concept artist did this, the classic concept artist, they would be like, oh, there's a fire in the background. Fire, 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 you son of a bitch, fire. And this is just the most, and, and probably because too, this is, Again, storytelling, only directors and production designers and stuff think like this, but like he's having a tender moment with this animal, clearly. So the role of the fire in this is just to show a little bit of hint that there was some sort of thing in the past, uh, but it's no longer. And now it's just about this moment with this horse. And so can you imagine like the moment with the horse is the reason there's not fire? Like concept artists don't think like that enough. Because like I said, if we're going to be concept gods and do everything, then you have to be every job. You have to be the director, the production designer, the storyteller. And by the way, it's just a thinking. It's a mentality. You, you know, most concept artists are so technically talented. So, like, you have everything. All You wield the giant mech. So now use it to kill blue people. Just kidding. Look at that. Amazing. Beautiful storytelling. I mean, if you go to Shot Deck, I will show you guys the website. Some of you may know about it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. There's a website called Shot Deck, Browse Shots. And what they do is they have uh, stills from movies, okay? And you can search all kinds of things. You could type in any movie. So like if you typed in Pulp Fiction, let's say. It doesn't have every shot from Pulp Fiction, but it has a lot of them. And you click on them in there. And you can, I think you can get a high, uh, bigger res version of them too. Or as big as, yeah, as big as they are in the film. And going through this shot deck, and we'll go through it a little bit more in a bit, is really a great way to think about how you're going to do, how you're going to light your concept art. There's a lot of great ideas here. And stick really, really close to it. Because then, let's see. You know, in thinking about where did I get my sensibility that there shouldn't be more in that Photoshop file, right? Where did I get that from? Well, I got it from like looking at movies and being like, oh, that's cool. He's very clearly silhouetted. The spec is causing him to be backlit. So he's a very good first read. Um, we absolutely can tell the story that this is some kind of structure, but not built by man, right? Man wouldn't, human men wouldn't do this. This is madness. So. It, you, in the building, you're like, apes made it or something made it that isn't people. That's crazy. That's production design, right? That's the part that's, that concept artists are missing a lot of times. Again, really subtle lighting. It gets the job done. So looking at that stuff enough, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, this. This is correct. You know, I don't want, I don't want this. I don't need that. I don't need the red cape and the helmet and all the shenanigans. Does that make sense? I will show one example, and this is uh, Florent again, um, because this is an image that looks like it was 3D, but it was all done with photos. So it's totally possible that someone can do this. 
It's like I said, it's just a dangerous game. That's the original picture. And then mud photo gets added and color corrected perfectly. Road gets added and you can see here, if I turn that on, you can see where he erased out the road, but he understands lighting really well enough to know how to delete certain things and add certain things. That building looks bad right now, right? But it'll get fixed. You have to look for and find like the perfect picture of cars. You know, it's clumsy when you first see it come in, but then if you grade it properly, it looks beautiful. Another car, look, you can see the stock photo. Again, a tree from another photo, really nicely graded. I'll, I'll zero in on one of these. So this car is crazy. So let me turn off all the layers here. Um, oops. Okay, so that's the photo of the car. So here is just a curves layer. Gets some of the job done. But Florent knows, and again, you have to really understand lighting uh, to know how to do this, but he knows that, okay, but this car is getting a lot of top light from this sky. Like this sky, even though it's ambient, will be coloring the top plane of the car quite a bit. So then he'll do that. Like a really subtle adjustment layer. And one of the things that in Photoshop that he's doing really effectively is in the blending options, there's this way of splitting the layer by holding alt. Uh, and he's just like doing this, bringing in what part of that thing that he wants, like letting the underlying layer come out. So there's that. And then there's a little bit more highlight because he's saying the Fresnel of the plane turning farther away is getting a little more skylight. And then a few plants. He covered up his majesty with this couple plants and then a grade over the whole thing, which consisted of a lot of different color layers. One of them was just adding a little bit of glow from the, from the top just to make it look more like sky and then keying the whole thing a little blue and then adding a grain. So it's not that um, it can't be done with photos. And if you are a master of both, well then hallelujah, you are like, you know, you're among the top, you know, 1% of concept artists that can integrate really well and use 3D. But now 3D does a lot of this. So I just wanted to show you an example. Um, and the cool thing, last thing I'll say about 3D lighting, letting the 3D do the lighting, is there's really only, the reason it's kind of straightforward is there's only two things. There's sunlight and there's ambient. So ambient is casting light everywhere and sunlight is, uh, you know, a sunlight. And it's casting some bounce on the ground and it's a hard shadow and then the blue tones are coloring the shadow and the blue side of the ball. And that's, that's basically it. There's only that kind of lighting. Let me open a blend file real quick. Raise your hand if you already know how to use a 3D software package. Okay, so less than half of you, okay. So then in that case, I'll, I'll, I'll belabor the 3D just a tiny bit. Um, this is Blender, the software we use, and like I said, I'm not gonna get too technical. I will say one thing that I think helps you understand the architecture of this program, because I just think it's really important, and you could be have used Blender for a long time and not know this. When you open up this thing, it's very scary because there's just a lot of things going on. But I just want to point you to one thing. Everything, you see this stuff and this stuff and this stuff and this stuff, it's all a window. And you can change those windows to whatever you want. And the way you do that is in the top left corner of that window. I'm only saying this because when you, if you open Blender for the first time, this is going to be a little bit overwhelming. You're going to see all the shenanigans. But just know that if you see my mouse, as it scrolls into the tiny black space between the windows, it turns into a double arrow. And then I can click and I can move whatever I want. And I can click here between these two and I can move whatever I want. And this, move whatever I want. I only say that because all of these tabs on top, it looks really complicated. They're all just different arrangements of windows. And what you can do is when you click in the top left, you see this one has a little logo that says 3D viewport. 
every single one of these is a different kind of window. And this is all the kinds of windows that can ever be. So right now, if I wanted to make this main window look like this side one here, I would just go like that and click Outliner. Now I have two of that one. If I want to go back to what I know is 3D viewport, I go back and get 3D viewport. If I wanted to make this one 3D viewport, I click on that and go to 3D viewport. Now I have two 3D viewports. Does that make sense? There's just, every window is just a window and it can be anything. So you don't have to be stuck, you know, with the program the way it looks or be scared of it. Um, here's why the 3D does the lighting. Uh, right now I'm in the solid mode. I'm gonna go to uh, render mode here, which is clicking a button. And this is all just grabbed 3D assets. And for example, and I'll, and I'll go into this a little bit more, a little bit later, but I just wanna show a quick how it kind of works. This is an app called Physical Sun and Sky, but I can just move the sun around. Actually, no, I'm gonna move the sun around a different way because I had my sun set to zero. Okay, here's my sun. Let's see. I'm gonna, I have the sun selected here. Oops. I'm gonna hit R and rotate. You see that? So if I have, if you have the ability, right, in 3D effortlessly to just go like that and be like, okay, the sun's over here. All right, the sun is over there and it's casting shadows and all of that lighting information is accurate. Well, then, you know, good luck trying to mimic it. You might as well kind of get as far as you can with it in 3D. Okie doke. The last thing I wanted to mention is just photo reference. We do a lot of like uh, traveling to different locations. These are pictures from stuff we've, places we've gone. The iPhone actually takes really good accurate photos. So if you are using an iPhone uh, or you have one, or probably the Samsung too, you can get really great pictures and then use those as good accurate reference. Cause they, the, color, the color in a photo in the iPhone is incredible, incredibly accurate to real life. Okie doke. All right, any questions about that? They were assets, indeed. I'll tell you all about it, but just because you asked, and I'll talk about it now, all the assets there were gotten from Quixel Bridge. Exactly. So those are Megascan's assets. The water, the water I made, but the rest were Megascan assets. And I'll show you about the character. The wall was a Megascan's wall. And then the character was another app add-on called Humagen, but I'll, I'll show you guys that in a minute. Um, the other thing I wanted to discuss here, oh, the next thing, is that, uh, Compose around the story and tell less better story. By the way, what are we out on time? When, when are we out of here? 5.45? I think so. What's that? Meh. I'll keep going. Um, the next thing, learn to compose around the story better and tell less story. Okay, so here's an example of that. Okay, so this is, this is just a regular photo, right? And this is kind of what it means to compose for story. So concept artists, a lot of times, you have a great scene, you made this awesome thing in Blender. And here's an example of what I would say are the millions of decisions that's the difference between, let's say, a concept artist or just an artist that was doing something else, is we're always composing for story. So now, this is just a picture with no story. This is a story of this guy, and he's going to this farm. And we don't know why he's going to this farm, but he's over here going to the farm. A lot of things were intentional. Everything was intentional. I use what was there in real life, but a lot of times in 3D, what I might do is, you saw how nice the assets are. You have great assets, okay, great. So then you make this beautiful scene. Okay, great. I'll take that into Photoshop. This is an actual photo, but I'll take that into Photoshop and I'll say, okay, what's my story? And I'll just start scribbling in Photoshop. And that's what this is, just scribbles. And the intention is to say, okay, we have a horseman. He's going off in the distance. I, I decided there's gonna be sunlight right here, but why did I decide that? to pop the guy, right? So that you can see him. So that he stands out as a first read. Um, 
the house in the distance also is getting sunlight. It's a little conspicuous that this is some light and this house is both getting a side of light, both of them together. But that's because I want him to be going to that. So I wanted to light the side of the house. These plants are all designed in a way to lead your eye to him. So they're designed to block you from going out of the picture and to lead you to coming into the picture. This log is designed to point you inside the picture. This, again, is designed to block you from going out of the picture. This river is designed to create an arrow to point you into the picture. So you see, like, every decision, every single thing, every single thing in the shot that I added is with the intention of telling the story of this guy, or leading your eye to this guy to tell the story that this guy is going from here to here. So it's not like they asked us for an environment concept. So it's not like maybe we even needed to put the character in there. But the reason we do it is because we want to have a story for every shot. It's nice. It's nice. It makes it, makes it a picture instead of just a thing for the modelers to build off of. Even this top area here, you see the clouds in the top? Even that was designed to say, okay, initially my eye was going too much up here. My, I was just looking at it too much. So what I wanted to do was to say, okay, I want to block you from going out there. You don't get to. All of it is just around, okay, what am I going to do to keep you in the picture? Any questions about that? Yeah. That's exactly the whole secret. This talk is done. We don't need to do any more. That's everything. That's, that's literally the secret recipe to making awesome concept art is to, um, is, to go, is to do the back and forth. That's what Aton does, which is a good segue to some of Aton's images. Aton Zana, if you guys don't know, is master of juice. He's juice master supreme. And all of his pictures have really clear stories. And by the way, this was a two-hour talk, so if you have to leave to go to the other talk, totally, to go to some other talk, feel free. Um, he builds a simple 3D. He builds a really simple 3D base and comes up with a cool lighting scenario and then goes on top of it in Photoshop, scribbles a bunch of stuff that he wants, and these are what his sketches look like. Now, he's, a great, he's great at drawing, obviously, and he's really good at keeping it super loose. But that back and forth handshake is literally the whole formula. That's how you make amazing images. And a lot of 3D artists who are really good, but they get kind of trapped is because, and I do this too, I get trapped in the 3D. I like made the 3D and then I love it so much and I don't want to break it. And then I look at the render and I'm like, I can't. So what I would suggest I would actually do is put a cutout filter. Sometimes we just put a cutout filter on it. You take your render, you put a little cutout filter in Photoshop and then uh, it makes it a little easier to just start messing around with it. But it takes courage and confidence. It's very hard to take a, a render and like mess it up with painting, especially if your drawing skills are okay. But if you can kind of move the pencil around and you can draw pretty confidently, then it's a little bit easier. Um, I wanted to show, oh, I showed you shot deck, compose for story. I wanted to show something else I noticed. All right. And this is something that is interesting about films. Like, so I went through a bunch of shot deck images. And I noticed that they do something that we don't actually do in concept art that much because we were taught not to do it. Uh, in concept art, we were kind of taught that this is kind of the way you do it, which is, which was uh, like, that, like that art I showed you where the, the little knight had a shine on his head and a red cape, and it was like too many things. Like he, you could read him already. This is kind of what we traditionally do. But look at this shot. I did a little blur version of it, right? You know how like in, in art, you like when you zoom out, you should see the first read should be the focal point, right? We all kind of learned that in school. Well, if you blur this one, the first read isn't the focal point. It's this fan, right? So are they bad at art? Like, is this professional cinematographer bad at art? No, there's a secret reason why this kind of works, and you'll see it in a, in a lot of uh, images. This one reads pretty well, but you see a concept artist might not put these hot spots in the background because they might feel like they're distracting. I would argue a concept artist probably wouldn't because you got this main character who's reading pretty well, 
And those things from far away kind of draw the eye. So it stands to reason they shouldn't be there, but they represent real life lights. So they add a little groundedness to it, but it's kind of an unusual decision. This guy is a little bit silhouetted, but he's got this competing, very warm, bright thing that's almost the focal point instead of him. How are they getting away with that? Why are they doing that? Why don't they make it just so that just he's the focal point? That one's traditional. This one is perfect. So in this one, the focal point of this shot is very clear, right? It's the window. It's the window. But if you look at it normally, yes, the focal point, the first read is the window. But because the story of the shot is this intimate moment, it's kind of okay that they're a second read. And also, there's a secret thing about film that we don't account for in concept art that much, which is that the human eye is always looking for the human because we're humans. So we walk around every day and we're scanning for information and we're looking for little nuggets that are going to be like something we can connect with. So our eye is biased towards humans. So you don't always have to frame the human in a way that is so dumb, hit you over the head like crazy, crazy, because our eye will find the human. And the reason I, this seems like a really esoteric thing, but the reason it's so important is because you look at enough shots from films, you look at enough things where like, oh, that lamp is the focal point. Why'd they do that? No, not if you're actually just watching it. When it's normal, you just look immediately at the human, and that amp adds a little bit of detail. This guy's contrasted with a little color, but the, the, the dark light contrast is over here, right? So the reason I show you this is to say, uh, to give you a little bit of sort of breathing room to say, look at a couple more films, really study the frames and say, okay, I can be a little more free with this than I thought if you consider that the human eye always wants to see the human anyway. So you don't need to like put a light on their head and backlight them and have their head silhouetted in the window. You can sometimes do it because the, you know, it's cool when it's, it's still cool, but concept art only does this. It doesn't do any other things. So if you have a story where you consider, okay, this is maybe an intimate moment or it's supposed to be the character is not, um, you know, necessarily hero, hero, hero in the shot. You could consider maybe the, you know, the bright spot doesn't need to be right behind his head. Um, compose for story. So I'm going to show you some concepts I did. I'm, uh, I'm kind of into animation style. But here's a concept I did. Um, this one, a variant, like, close-up of that one with some storytelling, um, this shot, which is another, whoops. And this one. So each one of these was trying really hard to tell a really specific story. So I'm writing animated features now as another thing I'm doing. I pitched one to Netflix a, a couple years ago. I'm working on another one right now. But um, for this, it's fun because it's my story. But even when I'm coming up with these shots, this is kind of how I do it. It starts like this. It starts with me thinking, okay, what's the story I want to tell? So that's the plane shot, okay? And I thought, okay, I want to have a plane. It's crashed. It's crashed and it's been there for a long time and it's kind of overgrown. There's some special, there's some special sauce in the cockpit that crashed with it. And from that special sauce, roots came out. So that was kind of my story. Um, and so then I thought, okay, well, what is it gonna look like when it crashed? Wouldn't it be cool if it was on the edge of a cliff? Cause it might look like it would have almost fall, fell over. Plus it's great to design this way because you only have so much screen real estate. Like you have this much in the frame, you don't have anything else. So like, it's kind of easy. Like if the plane's gonna be big, this big in the shot, where can it go? It has to go here. It either goes here or it goes here or it goes here, but that would be weird because the stuff would be in front of it. So it, it kind of just can go in one spot and you'll find um, even for like complicated key art, uh, you get bogged down. Like if you get a concept art job, that's like, let's do a, let's do a key art shot and it has three of our hero characters, right? And they'll say, okay, we want to see a bunch of different sketches. Well, if it's key art and it's for their promotion, well, then you know that the main character his head has to be visible and he ha it has to be like that, right? Th it has to take up this much screen real estate. And you know the secondary character is gonna be a little below them. And you know there might be a third two characters that are here, right? And they're all walking badass or they're all doing thingy-majigger or they're all whatever they're doing. 
but you, but you know it has to be that. So it's kind of when we have big key art jobs, it's actually a little bit easier than than you would think because you can't you can you don't need to do a variation where the characters are like like this. They're not going to do that unless they say, okay, we're doing like an, an environment shot with the characters small in it. But the, everyone wants to see their main characters in the shot, so it's pretty straightforward. For that other tree one that you saw, it was, it was simple. I was like, I want these two characters. I want two stories. I want these two guys chatting with each other. And then I want this giant tree of life thing in the background. And I want them to be sort of talking about it. And you can see, I kind of made the tree shot, but I realized that I was maybe trying to tell too much story in the shot. Like, there's this interaction happening, but then there's also this, like, tree, this like, giant thing. And so then I did another alternate one where, you know, I wanted to tell just this story. And again, why the characters are so important. Can you guys tell me maybe what you think their relationship is, these two people? What's that? Sure. Yeah, that's true. What else? Yeah. Right. How can you tell he's not listening? He doesn't yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of information, right, from body language. That's why it's, and, and it's not all that necessary. I mean, if you have a little character in the shot, it's not all that necessary, but like, you know one is the boss, you know one is the under him, you know the under him guy has got lots of ideas, you know the older guy is like, I'm sick of your shit. I don't want to hear your ideas. There's also like another layer of like the younger guy, he does everything with experiments because he's, you know, he's just got papers and things. He's actually, he's actually doing the job. Whereas the, other, the older guy is by the book, right? He's got his book. It's like, this is the old way we do things. And the other guy's like, no, no, I have all these other things that I've done. I'm like in the field. I know how it goes. Um, yes, let me open a thing real quick. Um, I'm going to open this in Blender. So those characters, just so you guys know the process a little bit, and it would, be ch it would change now because it's been a while since that image. Um, I would uh, make the characters, I would find a character in Daz or Character Creator. And let me just open it right now because there's no reason not to. Daz is a program that does um, kind of character generation, automated sort of character generation. And this is why, again, the 3D is so powerful because there's new stuff coming out all the time. So this is just a program called Character Creator. It costs $300, so most people don't buy it. Um, it's kind of like the new Daz. But basically, you have a character here, um, and you can just go and say, okay, I want some hairstyles. I'm going to click on that hair, and then I want uh, some clothing ideas. Let's do little shorts, and let's go to shirts, and then... Uh, Let's do some cool sunglasses. Okay, and then let's go to this and uh, do some female pose. So a really realistic character, and, and then you can buy all kinds of items. You can, there's a whole store. So that's how they make their money. You pay for the program, and then you, enchanting, let's do enchanting. Ooh, full makeup. That's complicated. No, they're pretty cheap, but the program's expensive. And then you can, and then, and then this program has an awesome exporter into Blender. Oh no, that's not PG-13 anymore. Okay, you get the idea. The reason I'm showing you this is because there's so many things that are constantly coming out that are new that like affect the way we work. I'm just gonna close it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and when you take this character into uh, Blender, you can like still mess with it and pose it. So in this case, 
I used, um, I used Daz. And I did a, a little bit of sculpting on top of it in Blender. Um, and then I just had the character here. Uh, let's see here. Does it still have a bones? Okay, so then this character, when it comes in from Daz or Character Creator, it already has the bones, and then you can like pose it how you want. So for all those characters, I don't even know how to sculpt a character. I'm really bad at 3D, but what I can do is I can take a character and move a few sliders around, and then do a little bit of sculpting and kind of move it around to make it how I want. The other aspect of this, which is another cool, fun, thing is Marvelous Designer. So all of these characters are sort of built, and then they're taken into this program called Marvelous Designer. And I'll show you this real quick because it's just, uh, it's fun. Marvelous Designer is a cloth simulation program. And like I was saying, remember at the beginning, I'll open this while that loads. Remember I was saying like there's this whole web, and then like you got to go a tiny bit into this whole nother software just so you can do clothes, just so you can like pose it, and then they can they can look good posed. Okay, so the way this program works, and this one is actually not that hard to learn. You make like a pattern like this. You make basically like the shape of the clothes, almost as if you were a seamstress, like you were someone who sewed. You make the piece of clothes, right? And then you just, put it around the body, you decide where it's gonna be seamed. For example, let me show you here. So like I click this piece, you see it's got those little seams on it. So I decided that it was, I made that rectangle and I decided the top of that rectangle connects to the back of the other rectangle. And then you hit a button and it like shrink wraps it to the person, right? So it goes like, I go this, fast GPU, it's a little bit fussy, but then you can just move it around and you can style it, and you can do stuff to it. You can pull on the pant leg and change the shape of it, and it all reacts to physics. What's cool about it is you design your clothing in this A pose, which is what I do. You know, I design, I, I got the character done right like that, and I made the clothes in the A pose. And then you can go into Blender, and again, I'm not gonna get into nitty gritty, but just to show you what the power is. Then you can go and change this pose, right, of this character, and as long as it's the exact same geometry that you import, you can go to import OBJ. And let's say I do, I'm going to go to this one, SK18 pose test. And then I'm going to load what type it is. I want it to be a morph target. And, let's, and then align to the bottom of the ground. And let's hit OK. Oh, incompatible with current avatar. OK. I'm going to grab another one. This one, okay. So you change the pose in Blender, you import it back into Marvelous, and what it does is it makes it so that you can, now the clothing just wraps around that. And you can pull the sleeves up, you could put pins in it, you can slide things around, and then you can export this 3D back into Blender again. And now you have really good accurate, like the folds that are happening on the pants. And the, it's pretty low res right now, but you can turn up the res. This is a good time to mention, actually, that I have this, this thing right here, which is a page that has a lot of resources on it. So email me if you want this. And the way you get my email is you go to the One Pixel Brush website and you click on hire us. There it is, Shaddy at One Pixel Brush, okay? So if you want, email me. I might make a Dropbox folder and add you guys to it, but there's a lot of resources in here that I'll talk about as many as I can before we wrap up. Okay, let's say it's 520. We have until 45, so that means we have 15 more minutes. Uh, any questions or special requests for the home stretch?
Yeah. That what? <laughs> no, sketching, you saw it. It's really important. The sketching is really important for design, I think. Because you saw the sketching came in in a different way. You saw in this compose for story shot with this thing, right? I, these shapes can't happen unless you can draw. Now, you don't need to be able to draw. You could do it a different way. But I mean, drawing really helps you to be able to create those shapes. It's just your drawing is coming out in different ways. So sketching is definitely, and also for those quick ideas here, sketching is important. Although here, the goal isn't to make the sketch look pretty. But you can see, even at the sketch level, the cool thing about the sketch is I already knew what it was about, this image. I knew the story was about her face. I wanted to see her face reacting. So it's a great way to like shorthand things. Any other questions? Or do you have a follow up to that or does that answer it? Okay. The thing that you mentioned earlier, the 3D trap, I built a quick 3D for this thing, right? And then I go in and overpaint on top of it. So exactly what you said, that is the master process, is you build in 3D, go to sketch, go back to 3D, go back to sketch. For this shot, there's no way I could have come up with that lighting if I just was in 3D. There's no way. It, would, it just would have taken me forever. I would have tried a million things. It wouldn't have worked. But instead, I got this. I got it quickly into Photoshop, and I just started messing around, and I don't even care about it. And when I'm working on the image, when I'm working on the image, this little sketch, it's not like a suggestion. I'm doing that, like I'm doing that exactly. Just like when we present to the client, we present basically a finished compositional and lighting concept. I also need that structure for myself. So this thing is done, I put it up there, and now every time I'm making a decision about lighting, this went back into Blender obviously, because you know the grass was simple and then the grass came here to scatter, which is an add-on for Blender, and then it went to that. You can see this is all I got out of 3D, or this is pretty much the end of the 3D. And then it went to that. Well, it wouldn't have gotten there. There's no way I would have gone from there to there if I didn't have this. And you can see I pretty much tried to match it exactly. Because my, my nuggets said, we don't need the background. You know, we don't need to see. Because if I was just been in 3D, I would have been, been like, oh, no, I want to see the floating islands. But the sketch told me I wasn't allowed to have them. Because that's not what this image was about. I wanted you to know they were there, but I didn't want to have them be too focused. Here's another, an artist that came to our workshop last time. This is a subtler, another example, but like, you can see the difference between like his 3D and his Photoshop. He got rid of some artifacts. He added a photo to make things more realistic where they were not, but he didn't mess with the lighting. He let the 3D do its job. You know, he added a shrub here, nicely integrated. But it's a delicate dance. Uh, juice shapes, style's not allowed. You know what? I want to talk about the 3D future. Okay, so let me show you when I was saying where concept's going, beginning to end. Let me show you how this, this kind of happened. So let's open this blend file and see what happens. So we did this really fun thing for Katy Perry. Uh, and she was doing like a, a commercial for a food app. It's all of your dream jobs, I know, to do a food app commercial for Katy Perry. But it was kind of fun because this was the 3D that we delivered as a concept to the production designer, okay? This is the 3D. So we sculpted it, we built it, we put materials on it, we did some iterations on it. Uh, let me see if it pulls up nicely. Yeah, let's close this. And let's close that. And remember, all windows can be, any window can be anything. I don't even want this one anymore. I'm going to go like, boop. Okay, so there's the 3D for it, just to give you an idea, right? There's the scene. And it doesn't have the materials on it. If I turn it on, it'll take forever to load. But the point is, that was the concept. And then we got a chance, because I happened to be in LA. The production designer said, you want to come to the set? And Marie and I went to the set and it was awesome. And it was mainly awesome because we were like, holy shit, what? What? Are you kidding me? Now, the production designer loves this. They love it because 
this is an interesting thing about the about production design and kind of the politics of it. The production designer on a feature film is, as you some of you may know, is the most top art person, not the art director. Art director does a different job, but the production designer. He talks to the director. Well, once he's done with all his production design on set, once they're done filming, he doesn't not involved anymore. The VFX supervisor is, who is another person who works at Lucas Arts and does all the VFX, right? So all the CG stuff gets done by the VFX supervisor. So the production designer really likes when they get concepts that look exactly like what they're going to build because then there's nothing lost in translation. Now, this didn't have a VFX supervisor, but the production designer loves the fact that he can just give this 3D model to the people who construct and then they build it exactly based on the 3D model. So that's a crazy next level power of this, of this process is that like now, like if you tell a production designer, I'm going to do the concept, but also you're going to have a schematic that you need to build it. Are you kidding? Like that used to be a whole thing that was lost in translation. And then here's them shooting. You can see there's like, I don't know if any of you have been on a set. I haven't been on many, but they're very, very boring. <sighs> Katy Perry came out of this door and went, wink and grab the bag uh, like 150 times in a row. She's a champion. I, I couldn't believe it. Like every time she would come out, she'd be like, ah, wink. And she had so much energy. And then she'd go back and be like, oh, fuck. <laughs> um, this thing, we gave them the 3D model. They used it outright, like outright. But I mean, it, you can tell it's exactly the same thing. Actually, you know, here's another shot. That's the real life thing based on that. They're good. These guys are good. Here's another one. We did this hallway. Tried different colors again. Once, you know, they knew it was a hallway, so it's easy to make a hallway. And then, and then if they want the colors changed, it only takes a second, right? Just change the materials. So that's, and that's our, you know, our concept of the hallway. And that's the real life hallway. If you go fast, you can't even tell the difference. And Katie rolled, roller skated down this with like three people behind her and crashed into Maria's arms. <laughs> they have this cool camera called the Techno Crane that goes into the shot. Um, okay, so that's why it's so powerful for a lot of these um, production designers. And I wanted to show something else that Piotr did. So one of the other incredible things about this process is that you can create all these, you know, you can take like a, these are photo scans, which is basically a camera takes a 360 picture of something and then, and then turns it into 3D. It's, it's incredible. There's the software that does it. And a lot of these were taken with drones or people make their own. But you make all these 3D assets and then one, you, you can slap together a scene pretty quick. And uh, in the same scene, you can make a bunch of shots, right? So that's just like what I did, kind of. You have a shot, you zoom somewhere else. You move there and you're like, okay, another shot, cool. You go somewhere else, you get another shot. So it's no longer about like, here's your one concept. It's like, okay, we'll create your environment and now we can do a lot of story. We can even move the lights, change the time of day, maybe change the story of the shot. Like you could spend, let's say 30 hours making your concept, but then after that, you have a, you have a bunch of revisions you can do in all different ways. And this is what we're doing and we're pitching it to professional storytellers and saying, no, it's not just a concept anymore. You get construction plans for your thing. You also get uh, an environment that we can try a lot of things in for an additional small amount, right? The initial concept took 30, 40 hours. All right, well, the additional shots take one to two hours. And so we bill accordingly, you know, if, it's, if it was faster. Um, another really cool thing I want to show you. We went to this after we went to the Katy Perry thing. This is what is known as an LED volume, okay? So you see this giant screen? It's made of a bunch of LED panels. And it's like an image of a car going down a road, obviously. And there's cameras in there tracking with it. And you can see that's the wall. It's, they have a construction where they, each one is a square and they put them all together, right? Um, and what they do now is they can shoot, and this is all, by the way, Unreal 5 in the background. So now, you know, wrapping up here, or we have another 15, to say how this all comes together, these LED volume walls. Let me show you one more. So we were at Epic and they were showing us, I went with production designer to see this wall. So there's the wall. It's basically like, instead of a green screen, right? It's this giant wall that has a picture of an old West. 
Now I want you to look really closely. So this is Francois, our production designer, and, and his buddy. And they're walking through the shot. Now, you can't see it too well here, but they're lit by this entire environment. So the wall isn't just a picture. It's emitting light. And it's emitting the same light as real life would emit. So when you watch them walk through this frame, check it out. That's them walking. That's the monitor. Do you see that? They exist, basically. Their lighting in the scene is perfect. And the background, especially if it's a little bit out of focus, you can't even tell it's not real. And so that's the new jam in filmmaking. That's what everyone is going to do. You can see there's LED volumes on the roof and on the side, and these things track the camera. Um, but uh, that's basically the future of filmmaking. So we're going to do 3D assets. Those assets are going to go into Unreal. By the way, there's no good way to translate between Blender and Unreal right now. That's the biggest obstacle is that you have the materials don't translate really well. Um, it's a huge pain in the ass. There's just no way to do it. If, if Blender files could be like one click and then it's an Unreal file, then we would end half the industry. Like that's gonna happen soon. And if any of you find out when that, the day that happens, let me know because then it's over for a lot of people. <laughs> um, right now it's so laborious. Every asset has to go and the materials don't come right. Back, both ways it sucks. And there's some ways to do it, but none of them are really good. So that's the LED volume. And here's an example, some shots I grabbed from this video online. And I want to show you the video because it's very cool. But this guy and the motorcycle are in real life. And by the way, they do what they call set dressing. They create the ground, and then there's some rocks, and then there's the LED volume. That's fake. That's real. That background's fake. And you can see they just changed, they just changed the time of day. So let's, let's look at it real quick, but first let me show you how it works. I made a quick thing here. I made an LED volume in Blender, like to mimic it, and then this is the camera, okay? Got it? So this is the guy, and this is exactly what it is, but in real life. Uh, let's see, there's a there's an LED on the top and there's an LED on the bottom and an LED on the side. And p keep it, pay attention to this guy here on the bottom left. I'll turn on his render. And he's also got a little ball in his hand. So you can see the other advantage of it, especially for like the Mandalorian, is you get all the cool reflections. Okay, so if I go to this interior thing and I connect my textures that I had to it, let's go to a mission here. Look what happens to this guy here. He's suddenly lit entirely like he's in that world. Uh, the roof, too. Let's connect that one. And if I were to click on this and I were to rotate it, keep in mind, let's, let's go here and get, make him a little bit bigger so you can see better. Uh, you know, I, I, did a, I did an okay job with this image. You know, I just grabbed an image. I didn't stretch it properly. But, like, you can see it's lighter on one side and darker on the other, right? Because it's supposed to be kind of, like, under a waterfall. So what if I rotate it? Look at him. You see that? So he's being lit completely by this kind of backlit. And you can see, for filmmaking, you don't have to go on location. You just shoot the damn thing. So imagine concept artists working in Blender, translating to Unreal, they're shooting the literal 3D that the concept artist made. It's not that far of a jump before that 3D is pretty easily translated into VFX. Like, that's the last step. In games, it's more tricky because it needs to be optimized for games. But it's not hugely difficult to imagine that very last step. I'm going to turn the volume off and just scrub a few things just to show you what they... There you go. You see them rotating the LED volume? And all the lighting is changing? She's real. That's fake. That's all 3D. Unreal. Oh, one interesting thing that, I, that is hard to know about this thing until you actually see it in real life, but watch the camera movement. You see this little blurry line? There's like where the camera is pointing is changing perspective. It's not a static wall. If the camera moves in, the perspective of the background is changing relative to the camera position. It hurts my brain. I don't exactly understand how it works, but that's what's happening. You can see it. Like the part that's in the camera's frame is different than the part that's around it because it's changing perspective. Okay, watch this. This is real life. This isn't VFX. That's just what happened to them when the lights changed. 
They just look like they're in a different environment. Oh, there it is. You see it happening? You see the background is moving in 3D as the camera moves? It's like perspective is changing. That's the power of it. That was the huge technological hurdle, just so you don't think it was just someone built an LED screen and that's it. They had to figure out how it was going to move in perspective relative to the camera for it to work. Um, yes. So yeah, uh, any questions about any of that? How much what? You know, it's a good question. Unreal built it, and I imagine millions of dollars. I think so, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's become, it's called, uh, the Lucasfilm is making it now, and they call it uh, Stagecraft, and they're trying to pimp it to everybody. But uh, working with, uh, we're working with James Chinlin now, who's the production designer for Batman. And uh, I'll scrub this one too so you can see. They took this to a whole nother level. Okay, so this is an entire LED volume around the whole world. There you go. So they're not even building sets. They're building sets, but only up to a point. And then they're building this whole screen and then they're plugging them all together. And then, and then there's a sunset. So the power of it is the guy's walking through a sunset, and then the, the cinematographer's like, I want the sunset to be over here. Just, just like I did, just rotate. The, the ver and then your sunset's now coming from a completely different direction. If it's under the sky, it's, it's real sunset. Exactly. And I know for, uh, from talking to James about this, Matt Reeves, the director of this, he, uh, this is the last piece of this puzzle. Um, they have a thing called the VAD, which is a it's called a virtual art department. It's a brand new thing. And what that means is they are making the whole movie in Unreal or in 3D, then translating to Unreal. The uh, director is putting on VR. He's walking around the space and he's like, mm, where should the camera be? And then he'll go over here and he has a guy who's sitting at a computer and he's like, I want one camera here. And then he'll look at it from there and he finds all of his shots and basically directs his movie virtually then they go out and shoot it on location based on virtual cameras they tagged. You know, like, this is camera one, this is going to be camera two. They go on location and, like, storyboards and animatics and all that is all just, like, live in VR. The director's deciding, and it looks 100% real. And he can say, like, move the lights over there that was over here. There's a really cool thing, too. Did I get a slide of it? Oh, yeah, this. This is crazy. So on the LED wall, you can also make any light thing you want anywhere. So if you want him to be lit from this side with a stronger light, you can create an imaginary light that's in the wall that's brighter than everything else that'll look like a light. So you also have incredible control. Like you can move lights around only on the wall, not even in real life, and it'll look correct. Exactly. It's exactly like that. Yes. Maybe a minor thing, but uh, what about the exposure of paper? I mean, there's a hole in the flat wall that shows up in the reflection. The what's that? There's a hole in the wall which shows in reflection. Yeah. How's it possible? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, in my little render, it had, like, a little yeah, big exactly. hole in the front. Because the reflections are captured in sphere. Yeah, so it would have to be completely enclosed. I wonder if they just moved the camera to a different spot, but that's a good question. I don't know how they deal with that. Maybe they fix it in post. This is the open questions time, by the way. Yeah. You ask for what? Yeah. Yeah.
What was the last thing you saw that you thought was really unique and new? You, th you, you mean from a story perspective or from like a visual design perspective? Uh, design and perspective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, now, I didn't say I was an art director. I say maybe. I was also being hyperbolic, just like when I said concept art was dead. I'm just trying to be incendiary. Yeah. You know, I, I found this out. So on that, sometimes the fight is wherever I, f wherever I think I can have a small impact. So, for example, on this, where is my, where is my fight on this? And this, this I acted almost as a concept artist a little bit. Most of the time the concept artists are translating what the client wants, and I'm not so hyper-involved. But in this case, I was, because they were asking us, they don't even know what the concepts are. In this case, I'm, my creativity is not going to be in defining what the building texture is or the fact that it's apocalypse 20 years later. My creativity is not going to be in helping them to decide. Because by the way, when you think about it, when Last of Us even came out, there was a lot of apocalypse stuff already had been. Like, that genre was already pretty, you know, old at the time that it came out. Um, but what made it unique to me was um, sometimes it's a little bit subtle. Like, in my case for this, it was like, I haven't seen an apocalypse cenote. I just haven't seen I haven't seen where the ground has collapsed. So my little contribution is where I can find it. Where, where, where do I have to play? Oh, I have this, you gave me this little zone to play in? Okay, I'm gonna fight that. For Neil, working on the game, his thing was um, mainly about the story. And I'll say this, and this is gonna be kind of contentious. I don't think being unique is, is, is nearly as important as being good. Good is the most important thing. And the analogy I'll use, I was talking to this guy. He was a Harvard professor. He, he, he used to be, a, actually, you know, he was a Harvard grad, but he taught at UCLA. And he asked me to come uh, do a talk about creativity, about what, how it's important to be unique in creativity. And I said, okay, well, what's your philosophy on it? What do you want me to talk about? And, I just, and he said, kind of similar, like, I want people to break boundaries and try new things. And, uh, and, he's, like, and he's like, you know, I feel like a lot of things are the same, kind of like what you're saying. And I was like, what's your favorite movie that you loved recently? And he's like, Avengers. I'm like, oh, well, you know, that was based on comic books, right? And he's like, yeah, but like, I love creativity. I'm like, well, if you're going to get uh, food, what's most important to you that like, it's delicious or that it's unique? Like, are you getting a cheeseburger or do you want like egg fondue? You want to not know what the fuck you're eating. My point is humans, we talk a big game about how we want unique stuff, but we way more want good. And if unique happens, that's great. And from my perspective, the only way that unique can happen is if you have, first of all, some leadership that has a unique vision for something. Number two, um, you have the room to kind of play around and try something fun. And then a lot of people need a lot of courage to say, yeah, he's got blue armor. It's the most iconic thing about the show that this guy has blue armor. But it's pretty stupid, over-the-top idea if you were to first pitch it. So it's a fight that I think you, you have to fight for those little things you want as you go in the tiny little windows that you have to fight them. But you're not going to fight them. I mean, Last of Us 2, I think, was really unique compared to 1. 1 was more about a father-daughter story that we all could get behind. But 2 had all kinds of weird characters, the most unique thing being Abby. And I've never seen that in a video game in my whole life. And there was a lot of things about it. But it wasn't unique because the tree was unique. It was unique because there was some storytelling thing that was unique. And there were some characters that were unique. So... It's, uh, it's subtle and it can be a lot of different things, but you have to fight for your part of it, I think. Yeah. 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 It could be, but it's kind of, do you, I mean, you ever see rocks in real life and you'd be like, fucking God making the same rocks? <laughs> it's just rocks. 
So no, I, I don't care unless it really matters. Like unless it really matters. And that's actually a thing about concept art is like, do I care? Because what you're asking is like, oh, you're using this canned asset from Megascans. They want a realistic rock. I'm not fighting that fight. They're making a realistic video game. I'm not here to tell them they should make Valorant when they're making Last of Us. So the rock, whatever. The texture, whatever. Where am I going to fight my fight? Well, I think I've never seen a cenote in a shot, so I want that. So then I'm fighting that fight. I'm not going to fight the tree-style fight. In fact, I think it would have been great if everybody got together 30 years ago and we just made one crate. And then we all shared it. Like... We didn't need, how many crates have been made by how many artists in the history of the world? Probably four billion crates. Like, we don't care, it's a crate. Like, make a tune crate, make your Valorant crate and your Last of Us crate, and let's just be done with crates, and let's focus on something else. Yeah. I see more and more, you have to know more and more, right? The city is not enough, right? Yeah. And the gap is automatically, automatically getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Uh, and how do you, you feel about it? Because I know the industry doesn't care, right? Yeah. It's normal and it's obvious. Well, I love the new stuff. Whatever's new, I love it. And so it's because I was, I a long time ago sort of accepted my fate. And that's why I kind of made this map because I wanted to show you mentally why it's so awful and hard. But, and I can totally see why someone who sees this map is like, I really don't want to live in this world. Like, I want a world where it's clear. You know, I'm just going from here to here. But uh, I am definitely of the mind that, like, whatever the tool is to get the job done, and any new technology that comes along, just use it. If now you used to make trees and used to be really good at trees, and this add-on for Blender called Botani comes out, and now any idiot can just go click and have a perfectly realized tree, well, then your job is done as tree maker find another job. And, and, and I mean that like in the best way too. Like I love it. I'm like, oh cool, I, I, I don't have to sculpt a character. I can find a character from Daz and distort it. Great, awesome. I don't have to learn how folds work or it helps if I know how folds work because maybe Marvelous, it doesn't mean the fundamentals don't ma matter. Maybe this fold is not, it's not 100% real or it's messed up in some way. And you're like, you know, actually no, the folds in the middle work differently because I figured drew a lot and I remembered that. So you can inject your own, when you have, when you have real artistic knowledge, on top of this skill, you become like a super person because then you can do kind of everything and you can keep checking on the yeah, 3D. Obviously, but uh, smaller and smaller percentage of, of people will get in the industry, right? I, mean. I don't know if it'll be smaller. I think it, maybe, I'm not sure. I think in the last five years, I found that talent is a lot more easy to find because, because of a few things. Blender's free. Blender's easy to learn because of Andrew Price. If you don't know him, he has this awesome donut tutorial. He made it accessible. And because it's this sort of open source online community. So it's advancing so fast because everyone is making add-ons for it. And 35 artists I work with, they'll just say to me, oh, did you find in the Discord, oh, did you find out about this new add-on? You're like, what? There's an add-on for making cables? Like, it's just constantly moving. And for me, it's exciting. But in another way, it's sad because whole entire genres of art can, can slowly die out or diminish. Like, the ability to draw really well becomes less and less important. Still good if you know how, but certain things die and then new things are kind of reborn. So I don't, I don't, I, I'm sad about it, but I don't lament it anymore. I just say, what's the guilt end result? And then how do we get there the quickest? I think now it's kind of really similar. Um, and you know, our concept art that we do is always like, uh, video games are getting more cinematic. So it used to be a lot different, but now I think cinema had that visual language that is so classy and beautiful, like from all those shots. And games are trying to be more realistic um, or more cinematic and more storytelling based. So I think, I think they're really the same. I don't approach it any different actually process wise. No, I don't think so. Oh, you mean in terms of like the politics of it or the art direction? I would say video games is a little more, from the production designers we've worked with, everyone who's at a really high level is really cool and easy to work with. 
I know it's weird. It's rare for someone to get to the top of that pyramid and be a dumb dick. It does happen, but it's extremely rare. I found at the high level, everybody is clear. They know how to talk. They know what they want. They know how to articulate if they don't know what they want. Um, the only problems we've had, and you know, occasionally you have problems, but it's often with people who maybe are, you know, don't understand the process as much. Our biggest obstacle is convincing people to leave us alone for the time we need to do that initial step. And if they're a new client, they're a little bit like, mm, you're going to spend half of our budget and I'm not going to have seen anything. You know, that's a little scary for clients. Um, so that's, that's our biggest sort of like process hurdle. But between film and games, I think it's pretty much pretty dang similar. Who's the best and worst client? I have a whole, by the way, I have, uh, we did this at a workshop. I have an email thread with a client where it was, uh, where they hated everything we did and I go through it line by line, the politics of the response and everything, but I can't do it here. Um, but um, I think the high level production designers, like the James Chinlins, Francois, Dwee, those guys are like really great. But I think almost all of our clients are great because I don't think um, people come to us and uh, are gonna spend that kind of money and again, not know what they're talking about, you know? Cause it's, it's, you know, it's on the expensive side. So like people, we don't, get, we don't get a lot of dud clients. Occasionally we have a high level client that hates our stuff. I can't get into specifics, but we had one where the work we did was the best I've ever seen in my life. I, I couldn't even believe it. My like eyes were, I was like, oh, you guys are some kind of magicians. And the client hated the shit out of it. And I don't know why particularly, they had some politics going on, but they really hated it. And then uh, I knew we were gonna get fired uh, eventually. And we finally did. And they said, we're gonna take it in house. You gotta take money off the bill. I said, no problem. But I said, hey, I'll give you like 5% off the bill if you show me what you end up with. Cause I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta see. So, cause either I'm an idiot or they don't know what they're, you know, like somebody's wrong here. Like, cause I think it's amazing and I can only go by my taste. And uh, they finally sent the work and I'm like, oh, thank God, it was terrible. It was just like, we would have never, I was afraid that I've spent 15 years and I knew nothing, but in my opinion, they know nothing and that's okay. But that was a rare case. It almost never happens. We're almost always, people at high level, they just, we're all on the same page in general. It's, question in the back, anyone else? I think that's, uh, I think because we have till 545, right? So we got to clear out for the next thing. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Thanks.